We're here for most of the week. <coughs> Plenty of time to go into the now. <laughs> so much time, in fact, that we don't need to wait for anything while we're here. And so that's the other practice while you're here to let go of waiting, which is a mindset. Most people are completely trapped in it, and again, it's part of the conditioned, part of the collective human conditioning to be always waiting for the next thing so normal that m most people don't know it. Looking up, it's... When you observe it in people, how they act and react and interact, they can, can see in people's faces often that they're not here internally, there's an absence because they project themselves continuously forward into an imaginary future that they need to get to as soon as possible. Or an imaginary future that they need to fear might arrive. <laughs> it's either one or the other. And so there comes that expression in their faces and an entire energy emanation that is telling you, I'm not here. I'd rather be somewhere else. You know the stickers that some people have in the back of their cars that say, I'd rather be fishing or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the mindset, I'd rather be somewhere else. And it's almost they are looking for something continuously. When you are completely trapped in mind, that is the energy that comes with, and there's a tension that comes with that. One thing is certain, they are not at ease in the now. And you can living your whole life like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only the face. No. <laughs> <laughs> the body would rather be in the now. And so that's a collective pattern, not a personal problem, not anybody's personal problem. So one can observe that in oneself. This psychological need for the next moment and an unease with this moment. desire for the next moment because it's got to be more fulfilling than this one. <laughs> and that's the mindset. But it never arrives because it can only, the next moment can only arrive as this moment. Again, it's always this moment. So it's just got to be more than that. This isn't it. This can't be it. So there's the fear of the next moment, so the fluctuation between the fear of the next moment, and yet even in the fear of the next moment, you're projecting yourself to the next moment, whether it's a minute from now, or next week, or next year, what might happen to you, or someone close to you, or the world. 
There's a projection into a possible future situation that you don't want, but surely it'll happen. Those dreadful things will happen to me. And then they're being played out, those possibilities in the mind, continuously generating fear of future. And yet within that, there is some strange compulsion that you want, you want more of it, like an addiction. Although it's a very unpleasant state to be in, that it, it becomes a self-serving, it wants to, the state itself wants to perpetuate itself, that state of fearful anxiety, of fearful projection. <laughs> more, and then if somebody says, stop, you don't need, no, this is important, I need to worry about this. Fear of future, but wanting still compulsively projecting oneself away into a fearful future. And then the desire for, well, some improvement, something that I can add to the content of who I am. And of course, I need future for that. But I need to become more of this or that. It's the two movements. Fear and desire, both intimately connected with a mindset that lives in and through and is perpetuated by this f future. So one can observe that in oneself. The moment you observe it in yourself, you're, al you're already somewhat free of it. Oh, the mental projection, <laughs> the restlessness, the, the unease with what is. <laughs> and that is a peculiar state, normal, very normal, it's an un since life, the whole of life is what is at this moment, the whole of life is inseparable from the suchness of this moment, since there is never anything else in your experience except the suchness of this moment. It's always what is now. And the mindset, if that is a denial or a rejection or a resistance to what is now, then that is your relationship with life is one of rejection, denial, resistance, non-openness to that beautiful thing which is not a thing that is life, the vastness that is there, that intelligence that is there, far greater than the human mind. It's there even in your very cells. It's, it's within, it's without, and yet you don't know it when you are trapped in co these collective mindsets, there's a contraction. <laughs> so to recognize it in oneself is a great thing. There it is. And it's often with, with the recognition of this mindset operating, of needing future, and feeling it even in the body, that contraction, the unease, which of course leads to dis-ease if you do it for a few years. <laughs> with the awareness of it comes already freedom from it. You are not completely trapped 
in the pattern. You see it again, there's the seeing of it. And you don't take the next step after the seeing, you don't draw some kind of conclusion. You remember we talked about seeing the impermanent nature of all forms, seeing how short-lived, how fleeting the phenomenal existence is of every life form. And not to jump to some conclusion, to stay with the seeing of it. And here also, to see patterns in oneself and stay with the seeing, not draw a conclusion that says, you see, you're not enlightened, you're not going to make it. After 15 years of meditation, you're still doing it, you see. <laughs> What's the point? You might as well give up, says the monologue in the head. You see, you're, you're no good, you're, you're doing it again, you've done the workshop, whatever it is called, the retreat, and you're doing it again, it's pointless, you can't do it. And then you walk one conclusion after another. Or at a very early stage when you see it, the mind tells you, I have arrived. <laughs> and immediately you start writing a book about it. And so st staying with j simply the seeing of those patterns. With the seeing comes, yes, there comes the possibility of stepping out into the now. It often happens without any volition on your part. The seeing is already a stepping out, one could say, of those mind patterns. And so if the one thing you get here, you catch here, it's more like you spend a few days here, but there's only one thing that I endeavor to transmit to you, to avoid the word teaching. There's only one thing, there's not many things, <laughs> one thing that and it's more like, it's not so much that you understand that one thing mentally, it's like catching it. Oh. And if you only catch this one thing that is stepping out of being trapped in mind patterns, which are always associated with time, we talked about future, of course also past, Stepping into the now, your attention, your awareness from being completely identified with mind forms, thoughts, and emotional forms, or completely identified with surrounding conditions, your attention separates itself from identification with forms, mind forms, thought forms, and you perceive that as suddenly stepping out of time and out of mind, the two go together, into the now, that field of now, that before didn't even exist for you. So if you catch only that, that it is possible for you to step out of time and mind into now, and it, that is a an awakening. You awaken out of identification with that into oh, this moment. An alertness arises that is, can be compared to suddenly waking up 
from a dream. And you know when you wake up from it, suddenly your eyes open and you go, oh, oh, that was all a dream. Oh. And there's a similar qualitative difference between that state of consciousness, of alert presence, this is the thing to catch here, alert presence, and the state of dream-like state of being completely identified with mind patterns. And this is the reason why in the East, in India, ancient teachers speak of illusion and the unreality of the world and why they why they use the word awakening it's been used for thousands of years buddha means the one who is awake jesus speaks of staying awake stay awake don't go to sleep it's he was pointing to a state of consciousness and so the qualitative difference between that state of being identified with mind and awakening out of that is like coming out of sleep so in that sense, it's true to say that whoever is completely identified with their mind lives in a kind of dream world. That you have really, and it's the conditioning, it's the dream that you're born into. Remember the woman I mentioned this morning said, welcome to my nightmare, <laughs> becomes a collective dream to some extent, each person has their personal dream, the personal conditioning, and that is part of the collective conditioning. So here, it's seeing that you can step out of that. You can only do that because by grace, so to speak, the state of presence is already arising in you. That's why I can say to you, it is possible for you to step out of that state of being immersed totally in time and mind into the vastness and the beauty and the sacredness of now. And if you can't stay in that for more than a few seconds, it doesn't matter, but you stepped out. So I put it in those terms. I say you are able to step out and you will realize you can step out of that into now. And that may happen many times during the day. You step out of that and suddenly you realize, oh, I've lost the now. Where is it? Uh, here, and then perhaps one or two breaths can take you into the body and you sense an aliveness which takes your attention away from mental noise and the alertness suddenly is there and with that is also the alertness to sense perceptions. That before, when you were immersed in this, you were almost completely unaware of. Most people move through the world being only peripherally aware of whatever surrounds them, the beauty that is everywhere, but it's obscured by mind and mental noise. And then you step out, <gasps> oh. Some of you have already are already experiencing those moments and they and you notice in that state of alert presence there's a knowing that is non-conceptual you can sit here
feel your entire energy field. An alertness is there. Without a compulsion to interpret or label this moment. If you need labels, you have them. Sometimes they are needed. Somebody may ask you, what's your name? Or it's a label. Or your phone number, and then you'll know it. Or anything else, if you needed one. But the liberation that comes from not compulsively interpreting continuously, which is labeling, which is judging, which is only done according to the whatever the conditioning of your mind is. That's the way in which you interpret, label, and judge. And so you don't see what is. You're not at ease with what is. You're judging what is. And that's the mind. And with that, there is no... All those those things that make life worth living are not there when you are trapped in the labeling, judging, interpreting mind. Compassion, love, a deep aliveness, a peaceful aliveness, vibrantly alive peace, to feel that you are alive to feel the goodness of life every moment beyond what is happening or not happening at this moment, a deeper goodness, not the goodness that is a moment of happiness which comes and goes, but a deeper goodness that is the goodness that some people find the moment they die, the last few seconds before the accident happens and kills them, and to the last few, what they suddenly a disidentification happens from all the conditioned mind patterns. <gasps> and peace. And a deep knowing that despite those appearances which are telling you this is dreadful, despite the appearances on a deeper level, all is well. And that realization, you don't have to wait for some disaster to approach you to have that. And that's the beauty of true spiritual teaching and the power of spiritual teaching. It tells you, no, you don't need to wait for death. Death is a possibility of realization. Approaching death, imminent death, death itself. But you don't need to wait for physical death because you might not catch it even then. <laughs> not everybody does. So the beauty of spiritual teaching is really not only that you do not need a disaster, unless you truly need it, you do not need more intense suffering before you can get there. It's also some humans through intense mental emotional suffering w to a point where it becomes unbearable and then suddenly something within them collapses that would, could be is comparable to physical death but it's a psychological death. It's a collapse of the psychological structure of me that has created so much suffering for myself that it can't sustain itself anymore and, so to speak, auto-destructs. <laughs> <laughs> That's another way. <laughs> so life has all provided all these ways. It gives you death and it gives you suffering beautiful, it's provided for a realization of who you are beyond form. <laughs> and the most gentle of all, it gives you spiritual teaching, true spiritual teaching. But that only applies to those who are ready to hear. And not everybody is yet ready to hear. Those who are not ready to hear, they need to be 
con faced with death or intense suffering for realization. And they get it. And then there are some who are ready to hear. What are they ready to hear? They're ready to hear that you do not need a disaster to know who you are. You do not need d more, more intense suffering in your life, mental or emotional, before you can know. And ultimately, it's saying you do not need more time before you can be free of that. <laughs> that is the essence of spiritual teaching. It's telling you, you do not need more time. And everything in the conditioned human mind, con collectively conditioned human mind, is telling you, no, I need more time to find myself, to be myself, to arrive, to make it, to complete myself, to complete the story of me that is going through my head every day. It's not complete, so I need time. So everything in the conditioned mind tells you, I need time, that is the psychological need for future, more time. It says, I need time because I'm not enough, I need more of this, I need more of that to complete myself. And that is true on the level of activities, Yes, everything requires time. Any exploration of new areas or new fields, acquiring new knowledge, learning new skills, those things, yes, require time. But we're not talking about those things. We're talking about knowing yourself, being yourself, knowing the essence of who you are. And for that, then the here comes the spiritual teaching which says, you do not need more time to become free <laughs> of the conditioned mind. Of all of thousands of years of conditioning, it does not take a few more thousand years to dissolve thousands of years of conditioning. <laughs> to become free of time, you do not need more time. There's so much time accumulated inside me, I think I need another 5,000 years to dissolve that. <laughs> and not only does the spiritual teaching tell you that you don't need more time, it also tells you that time is the one thing really, ultimately the illusion of time on the deepest level the one thing that prevents you from realizing the fullness that is already here now, the fullness of life that is in you already, the completeness, the fullness that already is the essence of who you are. <laughs> do you don't, it's nothing to do with time. So it doesn't really matter in what way this realization arises in you. Ultimately, one could say spiritual teachings and spiritual teachers are redundant because through suffering and facing death, everybody will get it eventually through creating misery for yourself and others on the planet, which looks like the workings of illusion and unconsciousness, and they are, and yet, through creating hell on earth, eventually, they'll wake up <laughs> when the hell is unbearable that they have created for themselves and others. So, but by the grace of God, the one life prior to form, spiritual teachings are there for those who are ready to hear them. 
And so they say, you don't need more time. And you have suffered enough. Suffering has been wonderful, yes. <laughs> Nobody would be here if they hadn't had their share of it. I certainly wouldn't be here. I don't know where I would be. So it's worked. It has worked. It's taken you to this point where you're able to hear that message and recognize the truth. And yet, and the truth is emerging in you quite powerfully, otherwise you wouldn't have made it here. But there is another movement inside everyone, and that is the momentum of the conditioned mind that is still there. Maybe for a little while now it's in the background. It's says, okay. There's something very powerful that has enabled you to be here and that enables you to remain here without running away because it is threatening to another part of you, the collectively conditioned part of you. It is threatening to be here and it is not pleasant to hear about your own death, what you perceive to be my death. It's ultimately the death of an illusion, the end of identification with me, my story, my this, my that my problems, my this, my. But occasionally in the next few days, you may detect in yourself the momentum of the old coming back. What am I doing here? What's this all about? Or emotional pain, the old accumulated pain suddenly moves into your mind, the pain body becomes active and makes you think painful thoughts or self-destructive thoughts or thoughts that condemn others around you. Look at them. They, they are not spiritual. <laughs> I'm, I'm more spiritual. Look, they're just gossiping, that's not spiritual. <laughs> or they say, oh, these people, they're so spiritual, they've been at it for years, and I've only been at it for a year. They know so much more than I. <laughs> and then comes, you don't want to be here. Where can I run to? And if I can't run physically, I'll run away in my mind to a problematic future that I will have to face next week. <laughs> and a succession of things that are waiting for me next week that I have to deal with. And then you play out in your mind how you're going to deal with them. It's not the reality of now, you're sitting under a tree. <laughs> because in reality, life is not complex. It's a mental creation. The complexity of my life and all those things, I reality is simple. Because reality is this moment. And whatever you're being faced with at this moment. And what you're being faced with at this moment may indeed be challenging. But whenever you face this moment completely, the power to deal with whatever this moment presents will also be there. When you don't face it completely, because you're somewhere else, then the power becomes reduced to little or almost nothing. 
And that's the beauty of it, by facing what is in a state of openness, embracing this moment. That means the power is there, available. And right action arises out of that facing this moment as it is. And so you can only do one thing at a time. And you do it. If you have 50 things that need to be de you need to deal with, you look, one thing will emerge, and you deal with that. This is essential, so essential that even one Zen master once defined Zen when he was asked, can you explain the essence of Zen? He said, doing one thing at a time, that's Zen. Now, that doesn't give the mind much room for building up things, a philosophy, doing one thing at a time, but doing it completely, being completely here with that. That completeness is part of living in the power of now. It's always being completely here, not half or 80% or 90% somewhere else not really wanting to be here, but it's that yes, that uncompromising yes to what is this moment, the only thing there ever is. And that gives your life a completeness, and with that completeness comes great power, not power in the ego sense, great intelligence, great aliveness, great, also yes, compassion and love arise with that completeness. So wherever you are, you can be there completely. And if it's an unpleasant place, this happens to be the now. You might as well be in it completely, because it is. It is. And the truth is, it doesn't mean now you are stuck forever in that place that you dislike because you have given up your inner resistance. No, the miracle is that when you face it completely without inner contraction, which is the resistance, which is the no, the no which is not just a mental no in the head, which judges and condemns what is uh, and projects itself forward into some better situation. It's also the no that you carry in the emotional energy field as, and even physical. That no to what is, is the physical state of contraction in your inner energy field. No. And most people live in that way. So there's the mental no and there's the emotional no and there's even the physical no as the physical contraction. And then you can experiment and say, okay, there's enough presence in you that you can are now able to experiment <laughs> and say, okay, I've lived with a no for 45 years, 50 years. Um, I'll try something else now. I'll try a yes to what is. What have I got to lose? And then, for a day or a whole week, maybe on a retreat, you practice, okay, let's see how what it feels like and how I experience life when I say yes, come internally to this moment. And often you will not succeed, because the no is deep-seated. 
the yeah. state of contraction and the mental conditioning, mm -hmm. but there's enough presence in you now to see it. So do you recognize the, in the no and the contraction? And by recognizing it and seeing it, you're no longer trapped in it. Freedom is already there. You're now able to step out. One could the seeing is the stepping out. Oh, wow, there it is again. As one spiritual writer puts it, uh, you will often observe in yourself that state of no returning, and he calls it, you live in contraction city. <laughs> So while you're here, you do not need to demand of yourself perfection. You do not need to demand that you now, sh well at least while you're on this retreat, at least while I'm here, I should be managing <laughs> to live completely in the now without resistance. And if I'm not managing now, I'm obviously no good and there's no point in carrying on. <laughs> no. That's not required. You don't need to, you not even need to live in the state of yes for the rest of the week. That's a big task. How am I going to manage to live in the now for the rest of this week? <laughs> <laughs> The beauty of it is that's not necessary. All that's needed is this moment, and it's here. All that's needed is the openness to this, just, just this moment, not the next one. There is no next moment. <laughs> just, just this, to know whatever happens, to be with it. And if what happens is the state of contraction, to know that, oh, there it is, the inner no, <laughs> there it is, all right, let the contraction be there, and then you feel it. Okay, and see what happens when you, whatever arises, even if it see, seems like an undesirable mental or emotional state, that is not compatible with enlightenment, even that arises, and you are okay with that too, that's okay. That this now is okay. No matter what form it takes, the now is welcomed. So that is perfection. Not to, uh, to acquire an imagined state of perfection, the master, I need to become a master, a spiritual master. How am I going to get there? The only difference between you and the master, unless you may already be a master and just be enjoying yourself listening to all this. <laughs> the only difference between you and the master is that the master is completely aligned with what is, not against it a state of completeness and openness to this moment, whatever form it takes. They change continuously, the flux of forms. And the master is simply aligned with the suchness of now, not opposing it. Thereby, the master is aligned with life itself, the vastness and power of life itself, beyond forms in which life appears. And that can move through him or her. So that's the only difference. It's not some imaginary ideal of perfection that you need to reach. That's another big problem, as if you didn't have enough already. <laughs> <laughs> it is simply to be with what is 
in the state of yes with this moment, in to the alignment with that. That's the master. So it's not really to do with improving what is. That comes sometimes as a side effect of the state of acceptance. Not even improving yourself. You're not really here to improve yourself. Well, it's heavy stuff. <laughs> and some of you may have been working at it for years. And if you have, then you realize that, well, is that ever going to come to an end? <laughs> and on that level, you could go on forever of improving yourself. But re realizing a vaster dimension in which this little being exists with all its imperfections, and it's fine. It doesn't matter. And this within that vastness of now, <laughs> there exists a little story of me. It's a few accumulated experiences, some knowledge, sufferings, and then they are tied together in a bundle and it's called, you put write a name on it that you didn't even choose yourself. <laughs> Somebody else wrote it on it. And that's me. And some bundles look nicer than others. Some bundles of me were given pitiful things, dreadful things, and they were put together and tied together. And, and so that was your raw material. And then other bundles were full of nice things, but even those, no, that's not enough. That's not really, I'm, st I'm really, all those nice things in my bundle and yet <laughs> the fear is still there, the unease. So, and no matter what you, how you improve the bundle of me, what you add to it, not going to make that much difference. And I'm not telling you not to improve yourself. On one level, that works, because it's nice to learn new things and so on, but you can't find yourself there. Or improving physically, doing exercises, it's, that's wonderful, great. But again, where this is easier Fortunately, what w this is about is easier than improving yourself, which you can carry on with that anyway. <laughs> I'm not saying give it up, but don't look for some kind of fulfillment there or completion. And if life gave you a bundle of awful things and put a name on that probably you didn't even like, and you didn't like what was in it, you never liked yourself. East would call that bad karma. Well, it's taken you here. Can't have been that bad. Somehow it worked. Some people with a bad bundle get there more easily, more quickly than others with a very nice bundle of, of content, of things, of me, until they're faced with death. I was lucky. My bundle wasn't very good of s content, of stuff. So it happened. And it popped, P popped. <laughs> so it's, while you're here, you can practice being the master. 
not even, I'm not saying pretend that you're the master. You're not pretending. When you're aligned with what is, you're the master, spiritual master. Maybe only for a moment, but that's all there is. And then you stop being a master for a while. <laughs> and then suddenly, yes, the yes is back. And you will notice the power of it when the yes arises, perhaps increasingly, in situations that otherwise would have produced the opposite, a very strong no. When you feel the yes arriving in situations that would be judged normally as unpleasant or undesirable or even completely unacceptable situations, these things happen. They happen in the now. So-called bad things happen. There's a sticker also that says something like that. This is a paraphrase of it. <laughs> Bad things happen. <laughs> and yet, see what the power of that lies in an uncompromising yes to what is, to the now. What that happened, what that does is you are no longer dependent on this so-called bad thing that arises in the now, be it an inner thing, an emotion that doesn't feel good, be it an external event, but it's Accept it completely, because it is. And then something arises, so to speak, words are never quite right, something arises that is greater, infinitely vaster than that which appears only temporarily in the moment, the, f the form, the emotion, the event, the person, the disaster, with an uncompromising yes, it could be an illness that only gives you, that takes time away from you, so you're forced into the now. One of the greatest things that could happen to you, time's taken away, you're forced. That uncertainty, that you haven't got much time. Nobody has got much time, it's an illusion. Nobody in this room has got that much time. It's over fairly quickly. But at least you can still have the illusion, oh, I've got plenty of time, plenty of time. <laughs> and then either an illness comes, or a sudden disaster, or you get older, and then you get less and less time. Shrinks. And most people take refuge in the past when that happens. Then the, they, they live in the past. <laughs> Remember, talk about it. <laughs> Anything to avoid the now. So, if something is accepted completely, and what I'm saying now is very difficult to put into words, let's put it this way, you are s suddenly aware of the now the now becomes stronger than that which happens in the now. <laughs> you are you're more aware of an underlying field and, and spaciousness in which whatever happens, happens, whether it's called good or bad. You are more aware, at, le at first you're, it's in the background, so you sense something strange in the background that is quite pe peaceful. At first you, there's a you sense a peace in the background somewhere, even when something undesirable happens, and you say, yes, there's a peace that seems to be in contradiction to what is happening. Then, it, it de as it deepens, you, become, you are more aware of the now as a spaciousness than that which happens in it, the event or the emotion. And that's the 
essence of all. You can take all the teachings, the ages, spiritual teachings, and it, if you extract the essence, there it is that. But nobody has quite put it in that way because every age has a new, requires a new way of putting it. And you're tr if you're trying to understand it mentally, it may not, it won't be easy. You have to catch it. The, the words only point. So you're more aware of the now as an alive presence in which everything happens, a spaciousness in which it happens. How do you find the spaciousness? You cannot grasp it or look for it because it's already here. You find it simply by allowing. Allowing is how you find the spaciousness. Allowing the form that arises to be there, be it an emotion or an event, be it so-called good or so-called bad, or so-called wonderful or so-called dreadful, you allow it. You are not opposing it, as a, which is your... S people derive their identity from opposing this strengthens their little form, the me. The more the me can fight what is, the stronger it feels in its pseudo-identity. It strengthens your illusory identity to be in opposition to what is. The me feels stronger in it. That's why people practice it. it is. So it's they're looking for themselves, they're looking to strengthen their sense of self by going into opposition with what is. And in a way, it, in its mad way, it works. They, their illusion gets strengthened <laughs> of me. And they think they feel better. In reality, they feel worse. But they call it, I feel better now. <laughs> now I know who I am. And the frightening thing to the little me is that when you allow what is to be, the form identity, the psychological form of me, becomes, loses its boundary. It becomes more fluid and reactive, looking for a stronger sense of identity that goes. So when the form that appears is allowed to be, whatever form that form takes, that takes you beyond form. The allowing takes you into the spaciousness. And more than that, it makes you realize that the essence of who you are is not any form that arises. Not It is not this physical form. It is not the psychological form of me. And that's a w that is wonderful freedom that is suddenly there. And that can come to you even in if you were in prison. It could come. A complete inner freedom from react having to live in a reactive relationship to f forms. It doesn't mean that you no longer deal with things, it's the opposite. You respond beautifully now when you don't react anymore, when response is needed. So this is strangely, it's very strange to talk about something because, like this, because every word is form. It points, it points to something beyond. And you can practice here in these beautiful surroundings. You walk across the lawn, or you walk on the grass, under the trees. A little piece of paradise. 
and you watch. There is out there, all there is an essence that you cannot grasp. There are beautiful forms, yes. But there is a greater totality in which these forms are embedded, in which these forms arise. And you can sense that as an underlying field of stillness. So there's not much that you need to remember. Just remember this. <laughs> there's you're not here to achieve a particular state. You're not here to achieve anything. Because if you think you're here to achieve a state, to reach a state, it takes you back into time and future and effort and struggling and frustration. You're simply here to allow, to learn, to be aligned with now. Does that take time, asks one mind in this room. Yes and no. On the outer realm, of course, there is time. We meet here at a particular time, we spend a period of time here, but it all points to a deeper dimension of the timeless. There are other forms in which the very same teaching appears. The, there tend to be older forms. You can, if you look into ancient teachings, you may find the same message. But you have to extricate the message from the cultural accumulations around the teaching and the foreign languages and the strange words. This is the same arising here in a way that is, I'm not dismissing the ancient teachings, they're beautiful, and if you are able to extricate the essence, they still work for you. And this is the same teaching, but perhaps with an added empowerment because, uh, well, this is b good news and bad news at the same time. I was going to say, and I am saying, we are running out of time <laughs> in many senses of the word. Fortunately, we are running out of time. When the ancient teachings arose, they still had more time. Humanity could afford to be unconscious and insane for a few more thousand years. Now perhaps we have another hundred years where during which we could afford to be insane and then that would be it. The planet would, couldn't take any more. And by then, humans would probably have created so much havoc, they would have self-destructed through violence.
Could we for a moment, do we have any source of noise that for a moment we could turn off and we can simply enjoy the field of stillness? Ultimately, stillness is within, but the outer stillness can be a help. I guess there's always a little bit of noise in this age of machinery. Paying attention to stillness. Underneath any noise that there may be, there is a field of stillness. Usually, if you are the mind, you're only aware of that which arises, the noises. You would pay attention to that, be interested in that. Usually, m humans would be unaware of the silence, the stillness in which the noises exist, out of which the noise comes, into which the noise returns, the field, the underlying field of stillness. So while you're here and you walk out in nature, there is a stillness all around. Of course, there are also a few noises, but w c I recommend this practice to you pay more attention to the field of stillness than to any noise you hear. The noises are there anyway, and they are beautiful in nature. At night, the many, many noises, that many little beings that come to life at night and make a noise, and that there's an underlying field. One could say it's the canvas on which, in this case, the noises are painted is the field of stillness. So you pay attention to that. There are certain kinds of music also s where the that point, like the Japanese flute, maybe you, we may have listened to it this morning, we may listen to some more here. They p the, the sounds point beyond themselves to the silence out of which they come. That is the deepest spiritual music, where the sounds only point beyond themselves to the silence. And so they enable the listener to enter the state of... Then now, this is the beauty. When you listen to silence, you pay attention to silence, the mind becomes still. You cannot otherwise pay attention to silence. The mind can only pay attention to that which arises, the form, the noise that comes out of the silence. The moment you pay attention to silence, you've gone beyond thought, because it's not with thinking that you can pay attention to silence, because there's nothing to think about. There's no form in it. This is another little device that can take you to that state of consciousness that is beyond form, the spaciousness. And if you, when you walk in nature, it will deepen 
your way of being there when you pay attention to that field of stillness and you will you get a great sense of sacredness that is all pervasive throughout nature and that is beyond the forms that are beautiful too but there is a hole within which w h o l a hole in which all these forms appear a field and that is the essence of sacredness so the noises that you hear are the equivalent of your mental noise of thoughts appearing and the silence out of which the noises come are the equivalent of the inner state of stillness which is pure awareness prior to thought arising So these are little, I call them portals sometimes. The most powerful portal is perhaps allowing this moment to be that also takes you beyond form. Another portal is listening to silence, especially out in nature, that also takes you beyond form. Now the silence, you may not have it all the time in this civilization. It's hard sometimes to even find a place where there is silence. But you'll be amazed, even in a relatively noisy place, you may still be able to become aware of an underlying field of stillness, even in the midst of noise, because ultimately it's within. And in the end, it doesn't matter anymore. You could be in the middle of a huge city, surrounded by heavy traffic. And it's you're so okay with it, this moment, that there's great stillness in you. It, that stillness comes with a yes to what is. The compulsive noise persists with a no to what is. Thank <laughs> you.